Hey friends, and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome. My name is Wendy and I'm with Inspire Ministries and I am so glad that you have popped on today's video. Today we are going to be talking about and tackling a difficult subject and we're gonna be tackling it out of the book of Job. Now, if you're not familiar with the book of Job, it is a hard book to read, but it is a necessary book to read for anyone who really desires to look more like Jesus. And so today, we are going to be talking about a tough subject of what we do when we are faced with affliction, what we do or what we can do to help us in those seasons where we are afflicted with pain, suffering, distress and agonizing fear. I want to talk with you today about a subject that is very, very difficult, but I think one that is necessary. And I remember when I saw this, it just leapt off the page at me and I knew that it was something that I wanted desperately to share with all of you. So if you have your Bible, I would love for you to go get it and turn with me to the book of Job and let's just dive right in. Now, before we jump in today, I want to set up for you kind of what is going on in this difficult book of Job. Now, what we need to remember or what we need to know is that Job was a man who was filled with loads of integrity. The book of Job itself examines the suffering of one man who suffered precisely because he was blameless. Job was tested by the enemy on purpose. God had given the enemy permission, but he did so with a strict order that Satan, according to chapter 1 verse 12, could not physically harm him. And what we see almost immediately, right out of the gate, is that Job was afflicted by pain and turmoil. We read about how his livestock was raided. His farmhands were killed. Almost all of his sheep and his shepherds were destroyed by fire. His servants were being attacked and annihilated. And even his house collapsed and all of his children died. Now, I don't know about you, but that would be enough, more than enough, to cause me to have loads of anxiety and dread and fear and doubt and anxiousness. And after all this, all of this, Satan comes to God once again, and he asks him these words. He says, a man will give up everything that he has to save his life, but reach out and take away his health, and he will surely curse you to your face. And this is found in Job chapter 2, verse 5. So God agrees that Satan can do what he will but he is still not allowed to kill him. So now we see what happens is Satan goes after Job's physical body and he brings upon him physical distresses. And Job spends several seasons bemoaning his conditions and his circumstances, and rightly so. During this time, he has three friends who try to speak to him about his situation. Those three friends are Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. His friends suppose that Job is guilty of some unknown sin, and because of that, they try and persuade him into repentance. Finally, in the end of the book, we see that God appears to Job, and although he never gives him a distinct reason why he suffered so much and doesn't really answer to the suffering itself, he does confront him about his station, he changes his perspective, and he blesses him for his tried and victorious faithfulness. In chapter 32, we see the fourth character emerge on the scene. Another voice who speaks now after having listened to the complaints of the other three friends. What Job's three friends have done, essentially, is that they have failed to comfort Job during his greatest time of need. And Elihu, this fourth voice, was different. Although scripture tells us that he was angry with Job because he refused to repent, he was also angry with his three friends, for they had made God to appear to be wrong in their inability to answer Job's arguments. Elihu had waited for the others to speak to Job, one because they were older than he was, but when he saw that they had not further replied to him after their last conversation with him, he spoke out angrily. And what we see is this very bold speech that Elihu makes 
towards Job. He's not only confronting him at this point for blaming God, but he is serving to remind Job in whom he's dealing with when dealing with the Lord and his will for Job's life. Elihu also accuses Job of arrogance, and we see this happening all throughout chapter 33. He goes on to remind Job of who God is. And I want to pick up the story. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to get them and turn with me to Job chapter 34. I want to show you what, in part, Elihu is communicating to Job here. We're going to start in verse 21 and go all the way to verse 32. It says this, For God watches how people live. He sees everything they do. Now remember, this is Elihu talking to Job. He says, No darkness is thick enough to hide the wicked from his eyes. We don't set the time when we will come before God in judgment. He brings the mighty to ruin without asking anyone, and he sets up others in their place. Verse 25, he knows what they do, and in the night he overturns and destroys them. He strikes them down because they are wicked, doing it openly for all to see. For they turned away from following him. They have no respect for any of his ways. They cause the poor to cry out, catching God's attention. He hears the cries of the needy. But if he chooses to remain quiet, who can criticize him? When he hides his face, no one can find him, whether an individual or a nation. He prevents the godless from ruling so they cannot be a snare to the people. And then verses 31 and 32 say this, Why don't people say to God, I have sinned, but I will sin no more? Or, I don't know what evil I've done. Tell me, if I've done wrong, I will stop doing it at once. Now, our focus verses are verses 31 and 32, and I want to read them to you out of the New King James text because that happens to be my favorite version of these two verses. In the New King James Version, it says, For has anyone said to God, I have borne chastisement, I will offend no more, teach me what I do not see. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Now, I remember when I first read this and I thought, well, yeah, duh. Can't we all just ask God to show us what we've done wrong, to teach me what we can't see? But the truth is that godly people are willing to know the worst of themselves. They are bold in their endeavor to self-evaluate themselves. And let's face it, this can be a real challenge, especially under any kind of stress turmoil, or affliction. My commentary says this, it's not enough for us to be sorry for our sins, but we must go and sin no more. We might remember the story where Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well. He knew her sins. Nothing was hidden from him, and he forgave her of all of her mistakes, but he doesn't excuse what she's done, nor does he grant her permission to stay tied to her sinful living. He tells her in John chapter 8, verse 11, to go and sin no more. If you and I are truly seeking after godliness, if we are adamant about becoming more like Jesus, then we will ask him to reveal to us what we cannot see of ourselves and in ourselves. I remember having a conversation with my husband years ago when I was working on staff at the church that we were attending at the time. I remember being so convicted of this one area in my life, something that I was dealing with and something that I was struggling with in my own personal life. And I remember turning to my husband and saying, if I ever behave like this, if I ever exhibit this kind of behavior again, you have permission to tell me. I might not see it, so I'm going to need you to point out to me what it is that I'm doing wrong. Remember this moment that I'm telling you because you have permission to point it out. What I was essentially telling him was, teach me what I cannot see. Job's friend was suggesting something here that we, as Christ followers, have a need to take advice from observing. When he says, teach me what I cannot see, it is in regard to error or sin. And no prayer that we ever pray could be more powerful and more life-giving than this one. 
it might cause us initial heartbreak or discomfort. It's almost guaranteed that it will, but it will aid us in our spiritual advancement nonetheless. When we have the strength to ask God to show us the error within ourselves, we do so with this complete understanding that we are subject to error, that we are liable to making mistakes, that we indeed have a wicked and deceitful heart. And we admit that God never allows affliction without having good reason or good cause to do it. Instead of blaming God, complaining to God, or even denying the reality of what is happening to us within our lives, we should go to God and implore Him to show us what we've done wrong, that we may deal with it. Because chances are, maybe we're not even aware that there are some things that we are doing wrong. My commentary says that it is only when we do this that we will be in a state of mind in which we will be likely profited by the trial. I love this, profited by the trial. Can you and I look at the trial that we're facing, look at the situation that is causing us discomfort or anguish in any kind and say, how can I be profited by this? Friends, if God allows us to go through a job loss, let's say, and let's say I complain about it, talk about the unfairness in it, or maintain this evil, bitter attitude about it. I have not completely accepted the blessing that would come if I were to accept the difficulty with a meek and humble heart or a meek and humble spirit, recognizing and affirming God's goodness in it. I have a friend recently who has gone through an enormous amount of trials in her own personal life. I was faced with my own personal challenge one day and I remember calling her and just sharing with her some of the struggles that I'm currently facing. And I remember her response to me and she said this, Wendy, how will God get the glory from this? That is how we need to be looking at things. In the greatest sermon that Jesus ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, one of the first three Beatitudes of our Lord Jesus starts with this, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The meek will take possession of the whole universe. Remember when Jesus came to us on the scene of the New Testament, those who had waited a lifetime for the Messiah thought that he would come by means of conquest, and he would be a fighting warrior type savior. And yet almost immediately, he corrects this irrational thinking by saying, no, 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 this is not the way. I am not like that. And my kingdom is not like that. Blessed are those who are meek, for those are the ones who are going to inherit this entire universe. And so back to that job loss that I was just talking about. If God allows me to go through a job loss and I instead stay encouraged in the process, if I stay humble in my receiving the assignment and maintain integrity in the midst of all of it, all while clinging to Jesus and relying on his strength, then what I prove is that I am prepared to profit from the circumstance that I've been placed in. When you and I are brave enough to say to God, teach me what I cannot see, we are admitting that there's possibility for error that lies within me. And there might be something that I do not see that I need to see. It is maintaining a teachable spirit. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, we learn that there are Jews who were considered open-minded, who listened closely and eagerly to the Apostle Paul's message. Scripture tells us that they searched the Scriptures day after day to see if Paul's message was the truth. They had teachable spirits. Proverbs 23, 12 tells us to commit yourself to instruction. Listen carefully to words of knowledge. And then in Psalm 86, 11, David says, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I might walk in truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And again, he says it in Psalm 25, 4, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. David had a teachable spirit. Do you and I have 
teachable spirits where we can come to God and say, I don't know what it is that I've done wrong. I can't see in my human frailty, in my human weakness, I cannot see where I've made a mistake. So can you teach me what I cannot see? It is desirable for you and I to have teachable spirits yielded up to his ways. A constant submission to Jesus should be the very atmosphere in which the Christians live their lives. The King James text says that Job should say, I have borne chastisement. In other words, I bear, am bearing, or have borne it. And not only do I accept it, but I submit myself entirely to it and I receive fully the load with which comes with it. Charles Spurgeon says this, we must not be content with bearing what the Lord sends us with coolness as in something that I have to put up with. Neither on the other hand are we to receive affliction with a rebellious spirit. Neither are we to despair under trouble, for that, he said, would be not bearing the cross, it would be laying down under it. Instead, you and I have this obligation to accept trials and trouble humbly, to look up to God and say, I deserve so much worse than this, and you've only given me this light affliction, surely with your help I can manage this. By insisting to engage God in the conversation and ask him humbly to show us where we've made mistakes and to reveal in us what we cannot see ourselves, we are taking on the posture of a cross carrier. And we look more like the suffering Savior who, according to Isaiah 53, 7, was oppressed, treated harshly, and yet he never said a word. He was led like a slam to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Since one of the principal reasons for which affliction is sent is the discovery of sin and the purging out of all that is within us that needs to go in order for righteousness to take over, then one of the benefits derived from this discovery is the knowledge, the true knowledge of ourselves. Job learned this process that nothing obtained in this world was worth more than the knowledge of knowing God and having his sins forgiven. I love what he says in chapter 42, verse 5. He says, after all of the trials, after all of the suffering, after all of the turmoil that God allowed him to endure, he says in verse 5 of chapter 42, I have only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. When you and I become acquainted with our depravity and with our own sinfulness, we see God for all he is to us and for us that he never had to be. It changes everything. And that is what it's meant by profiting by affliction. And so friends, I encourage you, I do not know what season that you find yourself in. I know the season that I find myself in, and there are some things that I personally am battling, some things that I am going through, some afflictions that I would rather not have, some cross-carrying things that I am enduring as well. I don't know what it is that you're going through, but I know two things for sure. You are not alone and you can profit by the things that God sends to you. We can profit merely by going to him and saying, you know what, I don't know what I've done. I don't know in what grave manner that I have offended you, but I know that I possibly have broken your heart with my sinful living. And so I just wanna lay it out before your feet now and I wanna say that I desire mostly to profit by this. And so I need you to show me what I cannot see. I need for you to reveal the darkness that lies within me because I want to live by light. I want to live in the light of your glory and I want to live with you. And so will you show me what I cannot see? Friends, it is an honest self-examination. It's not easy. It's going to require some challenging times. It's going to require some difficulty, but it is going to be worth it. 
Friend, I hope that you are encouraged with this, and I hope that you have time to dive in the book of Job for yourself. There are so many nuggets of wisdom and great things for us to learn in this book. Friend, if you have liked this video, I would ask that you would give it a thumbs up. Would you share this with someone who needs to be encouraged today? Would you subscribe to the channel, become a part of this family? I would love for you to continue coming back for videos just like this, where I bring not only encouragement and inspiration, but a challenge, a challenge to change the way that you think so that we can live more like Jesus. Thank you so much for being with me here today, friends, and I'm already looking forward to my next video. Be blessed today, friends, and enjoy your day with Jesus. Bye, friends.